hello. Well, um, I'm going to talk to you for 20 minutes about China. Just by way of quick background, uh, China's moved very quickly. So in 1980, China, the Chinese economy, believe it or not, was one twentieth of the size of the American economy, which is, what, 35, 36, 37 years ago. Uh, and then, of course, it started to grow with extraordinary speed and uh, to the point where it reached more or less the size of the American economy uh, by, uh, by quite, quite recently. But China, the real impact of China globally uh, began to change a bit later. It changed after the Western financial crisis in 2007 uh, and uh, 2008. And this had a profoundly different effect on the West on the one hand and China on the other. The effect uh, on China, well, China basically kept growing, not quite as quickly as before, which was 10%, growing at about 7 or 8% a year or sit more like sit just under seven at the moment. On the other hand, uh, the situation of the West was, uh, was much more serious. Uh, the, 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 as you probably know, uh, the effect of the Western financial crisis on Europe and the United States led to more or less a lost decade. Um, living standards, I mean, this is an interesting chart here, you'll see that uh, uh, this is the proportion of households who had either stagnant or falling real incomes uh, in the period from 2012 uh, to 14. And you'll see very high figures. You know, Italy is almost all the Italian population. America, 80%. UK, uh, my country, uh, just under 70%, uh, and so on. And the weighted, the average of all the advanced economies was something like 67% uh, altogether. Or take another example of what happened as a result of the crisis, which is uh, this s survey about, will my children be better off or worse off than me? Now, basically the assumption in Western societies for many, many decades is, of course, my children will be better off uh, than I, I, I will be. Now, if you look at this bar chart here, you'll have to put your heads over a bit. But on the left-hand side, you've got China, 74% th think the net figure is 74% think their children will be better off. India is still very high, 73%. There's the UAE, 63%. Uh, Indonesia, 60%, and so on. And then you'll notice so far no Western countries. But if you move towards the middle, as it were, you'll see America on 6%. So net 6% net of people thought that their kids would be better off, but that means a very large minority felt they wouldn't be. If you, uh, my country, UK, if exactly even. 50% thought they'd be better off, 50% would be worse off. And then all the countries on the right-hand side, they're mainly Europe, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, Aust Australia, Spain, etc., all thought, and Japan, uh, all thought that their um, kids would be worse off. Now, that is a real barometer, I think, of pessimism, uh, that there's a sort of collapse in, uh, in, in, in people's view uh, of, of the prospects, their prospects in the coming period. Now, in 2014, uh, <coughs> this survey conducted by the World Comparison Programme of the World Bank, uh, you can see this is the growth this is the growth of GDP, which basically is the size of the economy, and the China's the red line, and the United States is the blue line. And you can see, extraordinary, uh, the way in which um, uh, uh, in 2014, by a particular measure, the Chinese economy uh, overtook uh, the size uh, of the uh, American economy. So. Uh, that was a, a, a great change. And meanwhile, uh, look at the uh, uh, living standards. GDP per capita is basically a measure of li living standards. And the Chinese, you see, starting in 1980, took a while for living standards to really take off. And then it, they've, they've uh, 
continue to rise steeply now. They're well over uh, $8,000 uh, uh, a head. China is still a poor, a relatively poor, poor, we probably call it middle income economy, but still in the lower, uh, in terms of living standards, in the lower band of uh, middle, mid, mid, middle in income status. Now, until 2012, 2013, in other words, five, six years ago, basically China's rise was economic. It didn't believe in throwing its weight around. It didn't have, uh, it didn't ha express any strong views about its position in the world, its role in the world, international institutions, and so on. Uh, the great Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping, who started the economic reforms, which led to this very rapid growth, said, look, you know, just concentrate on economic development. Concentrate, concentrate on reducing poverty. They took 700, with China's taking 700 million people, half the population, out of extreme poverty in the last 30 years. Uh, concentrate on economic growth. Those are, and leave everything else. And that's essentially Chinese governments pursued that strategy. But with the election more or less, well, not quite accurate, after the financial crisis, um, the attitude of the Ch China began to change. They thought, well, um, it, the, West, the, the international economy is not performing well. Um, the, financial, the major institutions like the IMF haven't served as well, and so on. And so China began more to express its view about uh, the state of the American economy, speculation, and so on. But the real change came in 2012, uh, with the election of Xi Jinping as the new Chinese leader. And uh, it started with uh, what he described. Uh, he introduced the idea of a Chinese dream. What is the Chinese dream? And essentially, his idea of the Chinese dream was, of course, you know, everyone's you know, what, dream about how you would like to live as opposed to how you, your, you, your parents have lived, or your grandparents have lived. Um, think about what kind of future you would like. Uh, what, what would you like China to be like? And last but not least, what should China's place in the world be? Now, this is a big question because, you know, China, until the early, mid-19th century, was the largest economy in the world. Uh, it was already in decline, but in s some respects, it was still the most powerful country in the world. But it went into huge, uh, precipitous decline throughout the 19th century. Um, it was uh, the, the, the Opium Wars, which were fought, fought by Britain against China, forcing China to open its ba uh, borders uh, to uh, the consumption of opium, um, were a particularly kind of um, humiliating experience for the Chinese. And by the end of the century, China was occupied by many powers, uh, European powers like Britain, France, um, by, uh, also by uh, Japan, the United States, uh, and so on. And by the end of the 19th century, basically China was so weak that it was forced essentially to adopt the, the sort of inter, the Western norms of the international system. Because China isn't really in any conventional state. It's a, in any conventional sense, it's not really a nation state. Uh, it's a civilization state. It had to abandon all that. It was forced to become like any other country in China, not thought of itself uh, in those terms ever, really. It, certainly never in its, in its history. So that there was a particular meaning, particular poignancy uh, in China, the Chinese dream, dreaming of China having a different kind of place in the world from what it had really for well over a century. So, the, and the Chinese dream uh, was the beginnings of the Chinese beginning to express themselves in a different way, to see the, the, the place of China and, uh, and the Chinese uh, in uh, a different way. Now, uh, a consequence of this was that the, um, the, the, the also 
China, instead of being, you know, everything's being done sotto voce, you know, very quiet, uh, not criticizing others and so on, China began to have express stronger views. And instead of just being a sort of follower of globalization and being relatively passive in its relationship with the United States, China became much more proactive, if you like, a maker and a shaper of globalization, which it never been. You know, it was a beneficiary in many ways of globalization, but not a maker of it. In fact, the Americans used to criticize it, you know, you're a free rider, you're trying to take advantage uh, of public goods provided by us, etc. So, um, but the most dramatic uh, uh, expression of the new Chinese approach uh, was this. Uh, this is, um, I don't know whether you've heard of it, uh, but I'm sure a lot of you have, which is the, belt, the great Belt and Road Initiative, the Belt and Road Project. And this was, um, um, I haven't got a, I don't think it's going to work, uh, but there is a a laser. Never mind, it doesn't matter. You'll have to... Um, the, the, um, the idea was the transformation of the Eurasian landmass. Eurasian landmass starts on the Pacific coast and goes all the way over to the furthest point, I suppose, is Portugal uh, on the European uh, uh, mainland, or maybe Ireland uh, off, the, off the UK coast. And this is home to about two-thirds of the world's population. So it's extremely important. But most of it, or, yeah, most of it is very poor. I mean, obviously, the European end isn't poor, but the European end is a small, relatively small minority of the population. Uh, but many countries in the landmass are, are relatively poor, particularly those landlocked uh, nations in Central Asia and so on, which have not really ever been uh, uh, on the trade routes and so on. So they experience relative uh, isolation. So China's idea was let's connect up uh, connectivity. Let's connect up uh, uh, the, the, Eur the Eurasian landmass um, uh, by, um, well, by, by two main forms. One is the maritime route. Well, so that blue line, do you see the blue, the blue wide line going down on the eastern coast of China and then going across uh, to the tip of India and then going to uh, the East African coast and so on. And then you see it ends up going through the Suez Canal, past uh, the Middle East and into uh, Europe. So that's one route. And then there were six, uh, there are six other proposals uh, of, of, of connectivity uh, across the, the Lamas. I mean, this, you can see that those are the sort of green lines, if you like, um, and uh, green and red lines. And they go, so some of them go right across to Europe, others are in a southern route, and then a northern route, which is mainly an energy route through Central Asia and so on. And then these, these smaller tributaries, uh, for example, there's one from India leading into China, and there's one that goes right the way down into Singapore and Malaysia, through Malaysia, then Singapore. Uh, and, and there's another one uh, moving right up north. There's a red line which doesn't seem to go, it doesn't really go uh, very far westwards, but that goes from China uh, to Mongolia uh, and Russia. So this is a hugely ambitious project. And the Chinese argument was, well, look, you know, we transformed ourselves by large-scale investment, state-led investment, largely in infrastructure, and it, we achieved these rapid economic growth, this rapid economic growth, and reduced our poverty enormously. Why, if it worked for us, why can't it work for all these uh, countries uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, across the Eurasian landmass? So this project is probably, you know, we're probably talking 50 years. So a long time. Um, but it started, the Chinese, are, the, the Chinese are not the only funders, but they're the main funder. And they've already spent about $50 billion. And there's already about 1,000 projects underway in different countries. Um, and a lot of the projects concentrate, you know, uh, power supplies, pipelines, railways, um, roads, ports, uh, 
enterprise zones like your Khalifa, the Khalifa port here, and then you've got, a, that you've got a developing enterprise zone around that economic zone. We've been very successful in China and in other countries. So the idea is to transform the Eurasian landmass, which is home to some of the poorest countries uh, in the world. Uh, of course, uh, in addition to this, uh, the Chinese um, proposed the formation of a new bank, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, uh, which um, was launched in 2015-2016, well, and um, originally the idea was just an appeal for uh, countries in uh, East Asia, in Southeast Asia, and in uh, and, and South Asia, that's Indi in Indian subcontinent, uh, and uh, also in Central Asia, and, and virtually all those countries, not all, quite all, Japan didn't sign up, uh, and South Korea initially didn't sign up. Uh, but then the UK suddenly, out of the blue, joined, and then lots of countries. So it's now nearly got 100 members. So this is the first big initiative. I mean, China had never done anything like this before. China had never taken a, an initiative to form a bank or any multinational institution, but suddenly it, you know, it made this proposal, <coughs> and it's been an enormous success. And the bank is now in existence. The headquarters of it are in Beijing, but the uh, the... That those who are running the bank are extremely multinational. Uh, and there's, uh, for example, there are three of the 12 directors come from the Middle East, um, uh, and, so, and so on and so forth. So you began to get this, um, the, this, you can see how China's become classically in this form, the Belt and Road, a ri hugely important mover on the global scene. And this, the future of globalization is this. You know, the Western globalization is actually been, as you know, in a lot of trouble um, uh, with Trump, with Brexit and so on. And I think the future of it is, is this. But the future of it is very different because the, the first phase of globalization, the Western one, was really first and foremost for the developed world, although the developing world like China and so on did well. Some parts did well, some parts did badly. Um, uh, and I think th the future here is essentially the developing world uh, for the next phase of globalization. Um, the other major development, I suppose, in China in this period uh, with Xi Jinping has been um, a shift in the kind of way they think about the Chinese economy and what the Chinese economy is. I mean, you know, you know how it started. The great change in China started essentially by um, uh, making really cheap goods for export markets. And... And, of course, the labor was very cheap. China was very poor. And there were many people in the interior provinces of China who, um, who had very, 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 very badly paid rural jobs. So there was a huge migration across China to the southern provinces where the indus initial industry was constructed. And this, this was the engine of China's transformation. So it was, uh, it was, you know, it's what you do when you're just getting started economically. When, I mean, at that point, uh, uh, I think about 80% of the population live in the countryside. Now it's a minority live in the countryside. It's the country's become, uh, you know, uh, those who've been to China, if you go to some parts of China, particularly on the, uh, the eastern seaboard and so on, they are very, very modern, extremely modern. You go to a city like Shanghai, and or Shenzhen, and it makes lots of European cities look out of date. Um, so there's been this huge transformation. Now, the problem was that, you know, as China became more successful, then living standards began to increase, wages began to increase, so they priced themselves out of the market for making these cheap goods, toys, um, textiles, and what have you. So they went off to other countries that were poorer, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and so on. And meanwhile, China began to upvalue its production. Yeah, that's the way that the value chain can work if you're successful. And so what happened, uh, basically China was no longer where it was. It couldn't have that kind of economy. It couldn't just be based on cheap production, cheap labor, for, uh, uh, low skills, not much sophisticated uh, capital equipment for export markets. It needed to change. And so um, during the Xi Jinping period, the other big shift has been what type of economy. 
and to basically try and move towards a much uh, more sophisticated economy, making high-value products uh, with a well, well-trained labor force and with uh, very good capital equipment and not least for domestic consumption. In other words, although China is the biggest exporter in the world, not to be so dependent on exports. And so we, China moved into a new phase now uh, and, um, and it, it, it has to do that. If it doesn't, it will get stuck. If it doesn't make that shift, it'll get stuck. Now, what is uh, very interesting about China now is, is, is uh, people used to say to me, well, yeah, China's going to get stuck, isn't it? I mean, the Chinese aren't inventive. They're good at imitating, they're good at copying, but they're not good at uh, create, you know, creativity and so on. Well, <coughs> uh, actually, what is extraordinary about China is how quickly that transition is taking place. Um, China's become very innovative. Uh, in a very short space of time. I mean, I, I, I go regularly, I work on new books, I've been in China for a third of the last two years. And um, just between this year and last year, I mean, I'll just tell you anecdotally that the surprise I had was when I was, I was in Shanghai uh, this, aut- this last autumn. And, um, but, and, I, I, and a year ago when I was in Beijing at Tsinghua University, this, the, these, these bikes started appearing, you know. And I thought, oh, they're quite interesting bikes. I wonder where you can buy those from. And then they started to spread. A year later, when I go to Shanghai, they're absolutely everywhere across all the cities, you know? And this is bike sharing. This is, I mean, China is the home of bicycles, but with the arrival of the car, bikes went into decline. But now bikes, have, the whole idea of cycling has become very fashionable again, amongst all generations, but of course, especially amongst, uh, amongst younger people. Um, so, the, 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 so, and you, you just stick. You, 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 well, everything's done. I haven't got my phone with me, but you know, basically, the, the other side to China's transformation, uh, like this, is um, mobile technology. In that, uh, does it, have you any of you heard of WeChat? Yeah. yeah. How many of you use WeChat? Oh, great. Okay, good. Well, I mean, if you want to. I mean, basically, when I went to Shanghai this autumn, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was about the only person who was using cash. Uh, They weren't using credit cards. They don't use debit cards. They use uh, the QR code on their WeChat phone, and they pay everything. And the banking system is also, which is some people think, is is much better and modernised than the UK one. So basically, there's a few foreigners like myself who are not sort of, you know. We haven't yet been um, entered this world, so we're still outside it. But uh, you go and cure. But it doesn't matter what generation. Of course, young people take to it easily. But older people, lots of, or everyone was using their phones to pay. You just put it up to the sensor, and you and you paid for your goods, goods and so on. And you can do it for lots of things. You can order your taxi that way. You can pay all your bills that way. You can um, you can. Fix your cinema ticket that way, and so on. I mean, it, it's so suddenly, you know, China's making uh, all any Western city I've been to anywhere, in states or in Europe, and so on. In certain respects, already seem quite old-fashioned, you know. So, and this has all happened within. So, I think the question: of, Well, what's the Chinese? What's going to happen to the Chinese economy? I don't think there's any doubt. It is not going to st- get stuck in the middle-income trap. It is going to make very rapid economic progress. Um, and um, and it has a very modern outlook. I mean, China's the first. I think I think it's true to say China's the first country in the world to say to their, all their car manufacturers, China is the biggest car market in the world now. It's about a third bigger, third bigger than the American economy, and they, they've, they've instructed all car manufacturers that from 2019, that is next year, that 10% of their production must be electric vehicles. Um, that's not bad for a country that hasn't had the car very long, um, and uh, and so on. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's uh, uh, explaining um, how quickly China has changed and China's place in the world. Um, by let me just see which is the next. Oh, well, I did have that one. Never mind. There you are. That's the membership in Asia, and then there were the rest of the other countries joined, um, and. Uh, I mean, another example while I'm talking about the economy. Um, 
You know, until five to ten years ago, the only uh, country in the world that had major technology companies uh, uh, of the new type, web, uh, internet-based and so on, was the United States. Silicon Valley, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and so on. Um, no other country. Europe has completely failed to generate companies of this kind. But in China, uh, over the last five to ten years, but especially the last five years, suddenly the Chinese have, you know, they've got Baidu, which is the equivalent of Google as a search engine. Um, they've got Alibaba. You've probably heard of Alibaba, yeah, which is much bigger than Amazon. Um, they've got um, uh, ten, Tencent, which, amongst other things, is responsible uh, for uh, WeChat. They've got Huawei, which is, uh, well, I'm missing something, uh, Huawei, which is a manufacturer of uh, uh, very good phones and telecom equipment and so on. So China is performing in the most, uh, you know, the mod most modern tech sectors uh, with, uh, with growing effect. And in some areas, as I say, not all areas, most areas I think it's still behind the United States, but insofar as um, mobile technology is concerned, in some areas of mobile technology, they're now ahead uh, of uh, Silicon uh, Valley, uh, which, is, you know, which is remarkable, really. Uh, and I mean, I, I, the reason I put, I put this slide up was because uh, these, are, these are the top Chinese brands in the top, the top chi Chinese brands in the top 100. And it's just that if I'd shown you this five years ago, it would have been mobile companies, oil companies, and so on. And now the top ones are Tencent, China Mobile, Alibaba, Baidu, Huawei. Uh, it's just, it, it, it speaks to the rapid change in the nature of, of the Chinese uh, economy. Um, now, what are the, what, how, how to look, how to think of the future? Well, this is a, a projection. Uh, of uh, the size of various economies, the biggest economies in the world, by 2030. Um, and just, just remember what I said at the beginning, okay? In 1980, the Chinese economy was 1 20th, 5% of the size of the American economy. You know, how things can change with such incredible speed. The projection is that the Chinese economy will be 34% of the global economy. In other words, one third of the global economy. By the way, Chinese economy was one third of the global economy in 1820. So we're back, back to the past, really. Um, and then in India, the second at 19 percent, and America is only 15 percent. And the American economy would be, well, not on this projection, less than half the size uh, of the Chinese economy. Um, and the EU, 30 percent. So if you put EU and the US together, 28 percent it's a lot smaller uh, than uh, the, the Chinese economy.